Hi guys, Goose here and welcome to The Guitar Show. In this video, we're gonna be checking out the Gibson Explorer and all the legendary players that made this guitar so special. In fact, when Gibson first released it, as you probably well know, it wasn't actually a success. In fact, very few models were released from the Gibson factory. But without further ado, let's check out some of these legends that played it. One of the first noted guitar players to play a Gibson Explorer was Don Preston, the guitarist for Leon Russell. Don had an illustrious solo career, but he also sessioned for many other well-known artists. Don toured with Joe Cocker between April and May 1970. And this is the earliest photo we can see of Don using a Gibson Explorer. In 1971, a war of independence was escalating in Bangladesh. Ravi Shankar joined with George Harrison to respond to this crisis. Harrison organized a charity concert and it was called Concert for Bangladesh. It was attended by over 40,000 people in Madison Square Garden. It was held on August the 1st, 1971. At this concert, you can see Don Preston playing his 1958 Explorer. He used his guitar to back Leon Russell and other musicians on stage. And his soloing and tone caught the attention of Eric Clapton. And in this photo, we can see Don and Eric together performing at the concert. Eric purchased his Gibson Explorer at the Alex Music Instruments shop in New York around 1974. And as you can see, one interesting fact about this guitar is that the upper back belt of the guitar has been shortened. Rumour has it that Eric believed this came about as a result of it being an original prototype. However, he later found out that this was not the case and it had been modified by the previous owner. Now, apparently this made Eric really angry to the point of him trying to return the guitar to the store. Regardless of this, he used the guitar on the album EC Was Here, which was released in 1975. And it's also photographed here for a Music Man ad for the HD 130 reverb amplifiers in 1976. And you can see that Eric's sleeve is actually hiding the uh, lack of the lower bass belt. Clapton gave this guitar to Junior Marvin in 1977, who then sold it off to a private buyer sometime in the 1980s. Now, a lot of folk on the internet believe that Eric Clapton sold one of his Explorers to Alan Collins. But at the time, Eric only owned that one Explorer. And in fact, Alan Collins was believed to have bought his Explorer from Groom Guitars. Eric did actually, in fact, own a second 1958 Gibson Explorer, this time with an intact body. Eric said that he bought this guitar via his manager, Roger Forrester, from a fan in Austin, Texas in 1983. He used it on stage and is photographed playing it during the Arms concert at the Royal Albert Hall in London, September 21st, 1983. The supergroup who participated in the Arms concerts included Stevie Winwood, Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page. Clapton used this guitar for Rita May, Rambling On My Mind, Have You Ever Loved A Woman and Cocaine. Lee Dixon, who was a former guitar tech for Clapton, recounted the story. The guy arrived in Texas with this guitar. Ronnie Prola, a really nice guy and a good friend over the years, he says, I've got this Explorer. Do you think Eric would be interested? It was just before the $10,000 Les Paul, at the time when you couldn't really give Explorers and flying fees away. Eric used that guitar on the arms tool. So of course, Alan Collins was the amazing guitarist for Linda Skinner. Now there are two possible origin stories behind Alan's purchase of the Explorer. The generally accepted version was that Alan purchased the guitar at Groon's shop in Nashville sometime in mid-1976. However, in 2018, one of Alan Collins' friends claimed he bought the guitar at Manny's Music in New York City in 1974 for $4,000, which was quite a lot of money at the time. Unfortunately, neither shop has sales records from the mid-70s, so neither of these stories can be truly rarefied. In 1980, the tip of the headstock was broken through the B in the Gibson logo, but this was repaired. As related by Alan's guitar tech, Michael Sparks, 1980 Rosington Collins Band, we were playing in some theatre where the backstage was really dark and as Alan ran out of the stage for Freebird, he tripped on the monitor man's cue wedge, fell and broke the tip of the headstock. We checked the tuning and they went to play. I crawled around and found the piece which had the serial number on it and after the show we talked about getting it fixed by a pro but Alan said give me some Elmer's glue and he just glued it on in the dressing room. It was a bit crooked on his reissue Explorer that Gibson made they broke the headstock and glued it a little off, just like his 58. Alan made a few modifications, and these were a badass bridge. And originally the guitar had a traditional ABR1 bridge until sometime after the plane crash. It also had a short Maestro vibrato tailpiece with a metal arm. The mountain sockets from the standard wraparound tailpiece still remained. The next guitar legend that played a Gibson Explorer was of course Rick Derringer. 
Rick had one of the rarest explorers ever made. It had a split headstock that almost looks like a Gibson Flying V. Now the V headstocks actually hampered the tuning stability and that was one of the reasons why Rick sold this guitar. The guitar was originally owned by Randy Pope who sold it to George Gruen in 1972. The guitar eventually became so valuable that Deringer had a replica made for touring. He sold it to a collector for $10,000 and today it probably has a value of at least $1 million. Rick used his guitar live through the mid 1970s and here we can see Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top in the mid 70s which looks like to be a genuine original 1950s Explorer. Billy would go on to use many Explorer type guitars including his highly customised Dean Z guitar. This featured a completely white finish including the fretboard and had the Eliminator album logo running down the neck. He used electric horse shears to trim a path down the middle of the model for the strings, tailpiece and pickups. Billy would go on to use many Explorer style guitars in his career. Ok guys, no video on the Explorer users would be complete without the Edge. After Gibson's initial failure to generate any interest in their Gibson Explorer guitar, Gibson decided to reissue this guitar in 1976. In 1978, when the Edge was 17 years old, he went on a vacation to New York with his family and he had also recently just joined a new band. Upon entering the Stuviant music shop, he straight away picked up a Gibson Explorer and thought to himself how great it felt. Initially he was going into the shop to buy a Les Paul, but he fell in love with the Gibson Explorer. The guitar cost him $248.40. It took his new band some time to get used to this unusual shape, but eventually everyone just loved the sound of it and it became like a signature look. And not many other bands at the time were playing Explorers. From 1978, The Edge used the Explorer on every studio recording U2 did and he used it for nearly every tour. This guitar's really been through the battles and in one concert the actual headstock came off. Eventually The Edge decided to look for a replacement of the guitar. The Edge's guitar tech Dallas Shu says, The right ones are hard to find because Gibson had two different Explorers in production that year. The ones that were produced from June through December had a thin neck but the models that were produced during the first part of that year had a thick baseball bat neck. Those are the ones Edge prefers. And Gibson didn't make many of them, only about 1800 or so. Eventually Edge put his Gibson Explorer up for auction for charitable reasons and ultimately the sale netted $240,000. Despite no longer owning his first and most recognised Explorer, Edge continues to play them to this day. Ok now to the guitar legend that is Rick Nielsen. Rick has owned his first Explorer serial number 8108 since the 1970s. In August 1976, Groon Guitars listed a Gibson 1958 original issue, excellent condition, with a hard case Gibson Explorer for $4,000. And this was at a time when Les Pauls were selling for $1,500. Rick traded with George a few of his Les Pauls, some cash and a couple of Fender Maple Nick Strats that at the time were worth around $450 a piece to complete the deal. Rick's second Explorer, serial number 84549, was purchased from Larry Briggs in 1981 for $650 in cash and trades of other guitars for difference. Larry said it was easier to sell five Stratocasters than one Explorer. No one wanted them in those days, they were impossible to sell. Rick Nielsen has gone on to use many different Explorer type guitars in his career with Cheap Trick. Hamer Guitars started making tribute guitars to the Explorer in 1974 and the first one was of course built for Rick. They featured a mahogany body and a figured maple top, much like a Les Paul, with no pickguard. Next we have Matthias Jabs, the amazing guitarist for the Scorpions. During the 1980s, Matthias could often be seen with a Gibson Explorer. Apart from his 1963 Fender Stratocaster, for the bulk of his career with the Scorpions he used a 1979 Gibson Explorer. Primarily a Gibson Firebird player when he first joined the Scorpions, he quickly switched to the Explorers as he found them less fragile. He teamed up with the Gibson Custom Shop to co-design the Explorer 90, a modified Explorer with a 10% smaller body shape. This model was also equipped with a Floyd Rose and later became a Gibson Short Run production model. When asked about his 1976 Explorer, that was a lucky purchase so to speak. I needed a counterpart to Rudolf Schenker's Flying V. When I bought this guitar, there were two to choose from. I picked the better one of course, because it sounded so good. And as you say, it got used on all those famous songs through to the mid 80s, where I switched to the Explorer 90 which I designed at a music fair in Frankfurt when I met the Gibson guys. The following albums were made with those explorers, though I've always used a Strat in between and a Tele or Les Paul for more sounds. 
When asked about the famous gaffer tape stripes on his Explorer, Matthias replied, In 1979, I sprayed the first Explorer white myself with a spray can from the DIY shop. Then in Minneapolis, I saw a 1977 Explorer in white, which I bought and used as a second guitar. That was a moment I decided to put gaffer tape on one of them, making those stripes where the pots are. It was a spontaneous decision and everyone loved it, including our lighting designer, who told me it could be seen for miles. Later on, it would get painted on at the Gibson factory and it's been there ever since. He also added, the Explorer felt the best for me, both the shape and the sound. Okay guys, let's have a look at one of my favorite players, Gary Moore's collection of Explorers. So Gary's first Explorer was actually a 1984 Hamer Explorer. And Gary received this guitar directly from Hamer in late 1984. As you can see, it features a natural finish on a flame top with two full-size humbuckers and a stop tail bridge. Okay, let's fast forward to 2002 when Gary was working on the Scars project. Gary had bought a black and a white Explorer and was looking to use them live after recording with them on the Scars album. But this particular guitar we can see here, which is a red one, did not feature in the live shows of 2002 and 2003. However, Gary used this guitar on the Power of the Blues album in 2004. And here we can see Gary being interviewed with this very guitar. And now to a very good friend of mine and legendary guitarist, Rick Vito. From 1987 until 1991, Rick was the guitarist in Flute with Mac. And while on tour in support of Behind the Mask, they played Cincinnati just before Thanksgiving in 1990. And the day before, they had a night off. Rick says, looking to take in some entertainment, I asked the hotel bellman to refer me to a good blues band that was playing that night. Big Ed and the All-Stars were playing, he told me. You should definitely go and see them. So I went to the club with one of our crewmen, Pete Baines. It was a friendly place with a diverse crowd. We found seats and began watching Big Ed and his band. I didn't immediately get a good look at Ed, who was sitting by his amp with crutches nearby, because as I found out later, he had been in a car accident. At one point, he took the mic and I saw that he was playing an Explorer. At first, I thought it was just a reissue or copy, but then I noticed the tuning keys. Some of them seemed to be roughly formed into the shape of tuning keys. That told me that the guitar was probably old. So I moved a little closer and got a good look. The body was well worn and its finish had a deep patina. Rick thought it might be one of the 18 original Explorers. I started to get goosebumps. When the band took a break, I was compelled to talk to Thompson about his incredible instrument. Introducing myself, I asked how long he had owned it and he told me he'd bought it new in the late 1950s and had been playing it for 30 years. I asked, how is it that someone hasn't tried to buy it from you? Ed smiled and said, everybody talks about it, but nobody ever shows me any money. I said, if someone did, could you part with it? After convincing Thompson that he was serious, Rick told him, don't sell it if you think you'll regret it later. Later, Thompson finally called Rick about the sale. Do you think you want to hold on to it or sell it? Rick asked. Thompson replied, I decided that I could use the money more than the guitar, but I'll only sell it on one condition, replied Ed. You've got to buy my Flying V2. I just about choked, Rick said. Thompson told him how his brother, Opley, bought the Flying V at the same time Ed got the Explorer, then gave it to him while Opley stopped playing in the late 1960s. You can imagine what was blasting through my astonished brain cells. Thompson named his price, which Rick isn't disclosing, but says was more than I'd ever paid for anything except my house. And the next day, Ed bought both for Rick to take a closer look. The guitars were in cases made of plywood and a few nails with no covering or padding inside. Upon examining the guitars, Rick got the pickup rings loose, lifted out a pickup and there it was, the little decal that read patent applied for. Another quick look at the other pickup, the wiring and the serial number and I was satisfied that it was indeed a complete 1958 Explorer. After asking a few more questions, Rick and Thompson shook hands and Rick became the proud owner of one of the two most sought after electric guitars in the world. As we can see on this magazine cover shot, Neil Young is playing a Gibson Explorer. And this is from 1982, when he was performing on his Trans Tour. And by all accounts, this was an original 1958 Gibson Explorer. He didn't use this guitar for the whole concert, rather a few songs. Okay, let's talk about Dave Grohl's 1990 Gibson Explorer. Dave has used this guitar since the early days. And there's video footage of him using this guitar, which dates back to a Brixton Academy gig in 1995, which was very soon after the release of the Foo Fighters' first album. He used this guitar on and off during the mid-90s, and it also seems to have really come into the spotlight around year 2000 and 2001. 
Although around this time, Dave actually had two identical black Gibson Explorers. The first one had a neck bridge metal cover removed and it had a Nixon Watches logo sticker on the peak guard. The second one didn't have both pickup covers and had no stickers. Dave used these guitars in several videos throughout the years as well as countless performances. This guitar hasn't really been seen since the early 2000s. So let's hope that Dave will one day go back to his Explorers. Okay guys, let's go to Metallica's James Hetfield. After the neck snapped on his electric flying V in 1984, James started to use a couple of other guitars. And one that would become his main guitar was a 1984 Gibson Explorer. This had a sticker on it reading, so what? He originally equipped this guitar with the Gibson Dirty Finger pickups. James took the pickups out and replaced them with an EMG 8160 set. 1984's Ride the Lighting album was predominantly recorded using this guitar. He also used the guitar on Garage Days Revisited in 1987 and Justice for All in 1988. In 2008, he restored his White Explorer and used it on the album Death Magnetic. James's backup guitar from around 1984 to 1988 was a 1984 Gibson Explorer. And it's almost identical to his previous Explorer, but this one featured different stickers on it. Sometime around 86, James put tape over the original writing and wrote the words more beer. After signing a deal with ESP Guitars in 1988, James added a Jägermeister sticker over the original Gibson logo on the headstock and added a larger Jägermeister sticker just behind the bridge. James would go on to use many ESP style Explorer guitars. One of James's most famous Gibson Explorers was a guitar called Rusty. This guitar was used as one of James's main guitars for the album St Anger released in 2003, both in the studio and for the tour. And it was probably brand new around this time. The guitar features a matte black finish and tarnished metal pickguard. The rest of the specs were transferred over from his earlier guitars, including EMG pickups and a tunematic bridge. Both Kirk Hammett and James Hetfield have original Gibson Explorers. Kirk helped James obtain a Gibson Explorer for himself. When asked about it, he says, Well, the guy I got my Explorer from had three or four of them. I said to James, hey, this is the guy. And of course, James knows a good opportunity when he sees it. So he left with it. We both have the pair of Carinas, a Carina Explorer and a V. That's just what we like to call them. He has a pair and I have a pair. When James was asked if he took his 1958 Explorer out on the road, he replied, Once Kirk started bringing Greeny out on the road, that inspired me to bring the Explorer. Also, going to see Queen. Brian May is a wonderful guy, and we were talking backstage when his roadie walked past with a guitar on his back. I said, hey, what's that? He was like, that's the old boy. It was the guitar that he and his dad built, out on tour. I thought, hell, if he can have that out, I can bring the Explorer. Why not? Guitarist Elvino Ray played in 1958 Gibson Explorer. Ray was an early adopter of the electric guitar, playing it on numerous film soundtracks and Exotica albums. His instrument included a carbon thread microphone that was used to hear his wife sing along with the lyrics. The instrument quickly became known as his singing guitar. Elvino, who was primarily a pedal steel player, was extremely active with developing the electric guitar in the mid 1930s with Les Paul. Unfortunately, there are no known photos of Alvino with the Explorer. Thanks guys for watching this video. And if you wanna suggest to me some players that I might have missed or some, some of your favorite players that I haven't mentioned, please tell me in the comments. Also tell me in the comments which other guitars you want me to do a video on. Um, I wanna say that also you can support the channel by signing up to the Patreon. I'm also gonna start a blues course, Ramon's blues course very soon on Patreon, so you can check that out. But anyway, thanks guys for watching this video and it's good signing out.